So I know last week we kind of gave an introduction for the things that we're gonna we we're gonna see in Nehemiah. We had seen that the the walls were down. We saw Nehemiah was gonna you know soon in chapter one is gonna be called, and then you know he's off to the races to rebuild a city, rebuild a society, and so you know in chapter one um, we're gonna see kind of the burden, if you will, or the calling, kind of, if you will, of, of Nehemiah in his heart. So with that, um, you know, I started, <laughs> I started to prepare, and I realized a couple things. One, I only had 11 verses, um, so how was I going to get two teachings out of that? Figure that out, do an introduction, but then I was thinking, okay, well, how am I going to teach 11 verses in one when verses 4 through 11 are a prayer? What do you do with that? Um, but then I prayed, and after study, I realized there were some interesting things in here. Um, we've got prayer to discuss, we've got repentance, we've got leadership considerations, we've got ser uh, serving opportunities, and even talking about the promises of God. And on the serving front, um, there's a lot more than just talking about serving. We talk, well, I should do that, and I could this, I can that. Um, there's more to it, you know, having gifts. If you're not putting them into action, um, what are they good for? In Nehemiah, we'll see a man who's prepared for service of God. He's got a heart of God for service, and it's because of the love for people. God's people, just like God loved them. I don't want to say that the love's the same, because they're not. God loves more than we could ever do, any person could ever be or, or ever want, but gives us a similar ability, if you will, to, to have his love for people. And then ultimately, we'll also see Nehemiah. He would lead a people, and this gets to leadership, and he would inspire people to rebuild a city in spite of hardships and opposition. A lot of opposition and hardships we'll see put in front of him. It's also the story of a people restored through prayer to God's favor and repentance. As we know, this is yet another time where they got bounced from Israel and Jerusalem um, for deciding to do their own thing. And God sent them away, uh, kind of as a timeout, uh, to discipline them, if you will. And ultimately, we'll see through reading Nehemiah that he turns their hearts toward, back towards God. Um, God would use Nehemiah um, to accomplish God's desires of restoration for his people through prayer and repentance. And then getting back to the thought on prayer, it's no coincidence that the book of Nehemiah, the story about restoration begins with what? Prayer. As I mentioned, verses four through, uh, yeah, four through 11, it's basically a, just a prayer for God for repentance and different things which we'll, which we'll get into. So verse one, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chis Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So I think we talked about last week you know, what Nehemiah's name means. It means God's comfort, or God comforts, or God comforts you. And I think as we go through here, we'll see that, um, you know, God uses Nehemiah to be an instrument or a person through which God can comfort his people, so that the name is, is rather apropos. And then his father's name, Hakaliah, means he who enlightens. So we've heard it said here from you know the big stage that you know names, especially back in the day, actually meant something. You know, you give names for who you are, or what your family is, or what you're going to be. Um, and I think that names, in this instance, are, are in part an indication that um, while many of the Jews in Babylon were chasing the world, in the world, doing world things, that at least some, and I think this family, we'll see. Um, was not in the world. They were serving God. Yes, they were serving God in a, in a pagan society. Nehemiah was serving, you know, a, a pagan king. But we can go to work in the world and not necessarily be of it. We're just in it. There's a difference. So 
So again, I think it would be reasonably, reasonably safe to assume that this family had, had some focus in relationship on God and with God. As we talked about last week too, you know, he's serving Artaxerxes in Shushan. This was a per, in the Persian Gulf um, in modern day Iran. Um, in verse one we read, and it came to pass. Um, I know when I taught Joshua eight, I think I made a, a deal about it came to pass and we'll do similar things here. Um, because in studies and things and things that I've read, you know, it, it's interesting that, you know, when you see it came to pass when it's used in scripture, it's often an opportunity um, for what's about to happen to stand out so that you know things are tra have transpired for a reason, for a purpose, and it's just not happenstance, and it's just, you know, threw a deck of cards up and, you know, they all lined up or whatever. Um, so in other words, it's an indication how God orchestrates events. <clears throat> Something um, on, in that vein specific to the story of Nehemiah. King Artaxerxes here is actually the stepson of Esther, son of Artaxerxes, of the husband of Esther. So we find ourselves 20 years into the reign of her stepson. Why is this of interest? Why is it important? Well, if you remember the story of Esther, Naaman, to was you know uh, a henchman and and one of the heads of state in Babylon. He wanted to kill. Um, he wanted to kill all the the Jews. And so, as you know, the story Esther stepped in, was married to the king, for fear of her life. She um, uh, she still went before the king, and said, "Hey, this is what's going to happen. You know, Haman's trying to kill us." And ultimately, Haman got to see the gallows instead. So, the importance here is. Without Esther, without God's intervention through Esther, do we even have Nehemiah here getting ready to try and help restore a remnant to Jerusalem and then take it even a step further, is there a remnant to take back to Jerusalem? I don't know. It never happened. Haman got killed. End of story. Other verses of interest, just as kind of a little sidebar of this, in Joshua 1.1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' Moses' assistant, saying, if you go on to read, he's about to say, things are lining up, I'm about to send you back, or I'm about to send you into Jordan to take the land. That's, that's, that was a pretty huge deal. Luke 2, 1, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Probably the hugest deal. What's about to happen? Joseph. Mary, they're about to go back to Bethlehem, supposedly to pay taxes, ultimately know what happens. This is where Jesus was born to fulfill prophecy. And then I think my last one is Mark 1.9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. This is pretty much the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's baptized and you know, the next half dozen verses or so, you start seeing him pick off people to join him in ministry and pick him the disciples. So the point is, God's timing is perfect. He is never late because he is always right on time, something that we've probably heard, you know, in the main sanctuary, you know, at least a dozen times. <clears throat> and then we go to Hanani, or Hanani, or verse 2, being called um, Nehemiah's brother. As I mentioned last week, you know, you could look at brethren, I'm your brother, you're my brother, but we're not brothers by, by human blood. We're brothers by, you know, Jesus as our, as our Savior. So were we talking about a generic term here or, or, or what? And then and later in chapter 7, um, Nehemiah is going to refer to um, Han and I as my brother and kind of leads us to think that maybe it's his, his real brother. And this is in part why I made my initial statements or, or thoughts that this family was one being used by God. Because we know what Nehemiah is about to do. You can have a, a, um, a person that follows God closely without having a godly mother or father. But often, if you have a godly mother or father, it will lend itself to the children, um, <laughs> at least ultimately, um, being just that. And so I think, you know, again, I think this is kind of an indication that, that his brother was, was um, kind of in this game as well. 
So I guess, you know, I think Hen and I had a calling from God, from, from God for God's people as well. And it might even explain later on, we'll see um, Hen and I in Jerusalem, or, or Hen and I here in verse 2, reporting back to Nehemiah about all the things that are going on in Jerusalem. I had mentioned last week there was some things that I had read that conjecture said that maybe Nehemiah had sent him there to begin with to get the lowdown, and now he's back reporting. Who knows, but net net, he's con- Hen and I too is concerned, and he's given, he's given um, the word to Nehemiah. And then lastly, for him, um, ultimately we'll see Han and I um, given leadership position in Jerusalem after Nehemiah has built the wall, and that's in Nehemiah 7 2. But I have <clears throat> that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Han and I, and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than any. And then I asked in verse 2 demonstrates to me that uh, Nehemiah had a genuine, genuine interest and concern for the people of Jerusalem and for the city. So he was born in captivity. He had idolatry all around, but the Lord had given him a softness of heart for a specific calling that we're soon to learn about. A calling from God for some ministry begins in the heart of an individual. Sometimes we may not understand it nor grasp it, and frankly, sometimes you may say, how the heck did that desire for ministry to get for ministry get here? You know, looking at Pastor Kevin and how he got into children's ministry uh, here initially. I don't, you know, he can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I don't think his initial purpose in coming to this church was, oh, pick me, pick me. I want to do children's ministry. That's just where God directed him. Did a good job. That's where God put him for the time, and 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 it just worked out that way. The other thing too, on on ministry right, because there's all kinds of uh, different things. Um, with ministry, you know, sometimes it's children's ministry, sometimes it's, it's um, you know, uh, singing, maybe it's teaching, it, it's whatever it is, and other, and other times there's just different opportunities that, that we step into. Um, in, in having a desire to say yes, when you're like, why would I say yes to that? For instance, Sparkle, I don't want to clean my own toilets. Why would I willingly want to submit and say, yeah, pick me for toilets. And yet, guess what we all probably have done here at some point at this place? We have said yes to cleaning toilets and perhaps even more interesting things, right? So, um, so in 1 Corinthians 9.16, and Paul speaking to the Corinthians, he says, for I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So what he's telling us here is, if I don't teach, man, I got a problem. It's just there. It's just bubbling. It wants to come out. Nothing I can do about it. And I just, I just got to, I just got to do it. And then Ephesians 2:10, which you know we bantered about often here. Um, I think even mentioned this verse last week. For we are His workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's given us each calling. Each of us have talents, and it's God's desire for uh, us to be willing to let him show us what those are and how they should be used for his purposes. So a calling is not learned. Rather, God calls as a work of the Holy Spirit in an individual for an individual. It might be for a group or for some need, but he's going to call you. He's going to call you. He's going to call me for a specific task. So why would he pick Nehemiah? Could he have been picking Nehemiah because he knew that Nehemiah was the only one that had a heart that would follow God, chase God, and say, and be set up in such a place, being close to the king, that he would have opportunity um, to do God's bidding? Maybe. So if not, if not him, if not you, then who? So we find again, Nehemiah, he heard a discouraging report about Jerusalem, no gates, no roads, no protection. And like the children um, in Jerusalem, like the children of Israel was in a shameful place. And God had the attention and heart of one man, Nehemiah, and he would use him to rebuild a nation. 
Verse 4. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So you see as a result of the news in verse 3 that um, Nehemiah's heart, heart is broken. He's sad. Um, he, I think we'll get into some things where I think he knows what happened, why things occurred, and he knows that in getting back to a right relationship with God and praying first, that things would start going from there uh, in a positive way. And to me, verse 4, 2 is an indication that Nehemiah already had a relationship with God. When he heard, hears these things, he doesn't say, let's do a group study. He doesn't say, let's all get together and figure this out. He doesn't say, let me go ask six of my friends. He basically says, okay, thank you. I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to pray fast um, and frankly mourn for many days. He went to God first. Even though we are told to go to the Lord in prayer, it is not necessarily our first response. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. He's the only one that can resolve it, and yet sometimes we still do other things other than pray first. So the news that he got led him to fast and pray, and those were all good steps and, and frankly, the best first step to do um, to get a resolution to any situation. It is clear his heart was broken for the people, and God had given him a burden for those people. So just on the, the thought of, of what he did here, stopping and praying, you know, do we only pray for God when big things happen? I know somebody, I don't remember who it was, but somebody was saying, yeah, I pray where to go to lunch. And I know I was thinking to myself, really? You're praying to go to lunch? And he even said, I'm praying on what to eat. I'm like, really? So, and I'm not trying to make light of, of that. I mean, if that's his relationship, we're told to pray without ceasing about everything, he's probably at a good place. I probably should be praying not after I get my lunch, you know, thank you for blessing me, but where should I go eat, right? So, um, so point there is, we don't need to wait for some big catastrophe to land in our, in our lap and say, oh gosh, I think I'll pray now. That's not, that's not what our first response is. And I think if we're at a place where we tend to fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it until we can't, and then we take it to God, which I don't think Nehemiah did, which is why I think he immediately stopped and prayed, He's got a pattern. He's got a habit built here. Oh, something's happening? Pray. Oh, I need to eat? Pray. So it's so clear. That person, I remember who it is if they're listening. I'm not making fun of you. You're, you're probably in the right place. I'm probably in error. So, um, so again, you know, just waiting to call him in times when we're desperate. He wants to hear from us then. Um, but he wants us to talk about the small stuff too. And then questions to ourselves, do we sometimes just skip prayer? We resolve needs on our own without the counsel of God. We have our own resources, we have our own abilities. We can fix it. So I don't know how many of y'all guys got Chidrens and there was Bob the Builder and he said, who can fix, or can we fix it? Yes, we can, because he could always fix everything. Um, the point there is, in this country, we have a lot of wealth, a lot of opportunities. On paper, we probably can fix a lot of stuff for ourselves and for other people. Um, people can resolve their own issues. What do we say about people? Oh yeah, there's a self-made man. Really? Right? Well, self-made man can took care of himself, created himself, can, can do things for himself and other people. Um, You know, and then too, I was rem I'm reminded, I don't know if it was my, my first teacher or my second teaching here, but we got interrupted from a lady saying that, I don't know who was in here saying that this lady was saying her son needed medicine. And the first thing I did is, you know, I was ready to pull out my wallet, here you go, there you go, but, you know, I didn't do it immediately. But then as I sat there, I saw, um, uh, what's his name that just moved to uh, the beach? Hmm? 
No, it was a guy that just moved to just I can't remember his name. No, I moved to the moved to the beach. I can't remember oh, his yeah. name. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, yeah, Joe. So sorry. So he we actually talked after it was done, right? And he said, yeah, she showed up at my place three days ago with the exact same story, and we gave and that kind of thing. So me whipping out a 20, is that helpful or is that hurting? If at the very least I'm teaching her that deceit is, is the way to go, um, if I'd have prayed real fast or, or something, maybe God would have said, you know, this isn't the best time, but my immediate thing was boom, jump it, right? Why? Because I got 20 bucks in my pocket. I give it. Who cares? It's just 20 bucks. She, you know, she's got a need taken care of. So point there is just be, just be cautious, right? Just take everything to God in prayer and let him tell you what he wants you to do. So and lastly, or I mean not lastly, but, but I guess it's, it probably should be pretty clear that, you know, taking care of things on your own is not the best biblical approach and ultimately it becomes a slippery slope. We should be looking to work with God through prayer and then on his behalf. So we'll see in Nehemiah, it's a pretty small book, but I think there was like 11 different times when he just took a break and said, you know what, we're done, I'm gonna stop, I need to pray, I need instruction, I need assistance, I need understanding, I need something. He just didn't, just didn't always just push through um, on his own accord. So I think he demonstrated he actually got the importance of prayer. And then lastly, as we kind of get prepared to go into the next verses, you know, I was wondering with Nehemiah weeping in the morning here, do you think he was thinking about all the disobedience of his people, frankly, of him, um, and the destruction and reproach of the people? And, you know, why was Israel there in part to begin with, to be a reflection on what a relationship with God could look like? Well, if the city's broken down, very few people are there. They're in bondage now in Babylon. Where's the glory for God in that? There isn't any, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's been stolen for a while. So as we will see, um, we'll see he knows that it, uh, repentance was the only way uh, to begin restoration. <clears throat> and like Jesus, Nehemiah had a heart for people, and it stirred him. Does it stir me? Does it stir you? Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, we see Jesus' heart when he's weeping for people as he's coming in Jerusalem. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for peace. For the, day will, the days will come when upon you, when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Nehemiah knew, as we should know, what makes peace with God, and that's obedience. Obedience um, would have kept them at peace with God, enjoying the land that he had promised them. And sadly, for them, like us, you're obedient, start seeing the promises of God, the blessings of God, and then it's like, I got this, and you walk away for one reason or another, and things start happening. It's like, oh, I guess I need to go back. Um, if we were smart, we'd just be obedient, period, and things would be, things would be great. Matthew 9, 36. And this is more of Jesus being moved with compassion. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. So we need the eyes of Jesus to see the needs of people. We need the heart of Jesus to feel the compassion for people. We'll see Nehemiah wait on God in prayer to confirm the part he would play in restoring God's people. But I think it's clear by us seeing that he wept and he was mourning and he was in prayer that he felt for the people of God. Verse 5, and I said, I pray, Lord of God, 
or I, pr I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. So Nehemiah here in verse 5 is demonstrating an understanding that God keeps his word and extends his mercy out to those who love him and keep his commandments. Something to remember. Understanding the devastation and consequences of sin should lead us to a personal repentance as well as a seeking to restore others. This is a, a reminder personally and in the church in general that we should pray for our nation and the sins of people. We should be a covering for our nation. We see Nehemiah here praying, forgive your people, forgive my people, forgive my father. I think we could do the same thing for our country. And then only through the repentance, you know, God's mercy will be granted in restoration and peace, just as he promised the people of Israel. Perhaps a bit of a sidebar, but how many times do we look to God's promises expecting, um, expecting, or expectantly, while having some area of our life where, frankly, we're living in disobedience? My wife and I counsel, do premarital. They're not doing marital things. They're doing other things. And yet they say, I want a good marriage. I want to follow God. I want to trust God. I want God's best. The tithing. Nobody wants to talk about money, but you tithe. You rebuke the devourer. You're not stealing from God. All those things. But yet we say, God, bless me, bless me, bless me, while we're you know, keeping our wallet in our back pocket, we're saying it's my money, not yours. It doesn't work like that, necessarily. Um, <clears throat> God may choose to, to uh, bless us in spite of ourselves, because you know, we see people walking around that are just loaded, and we know that they're heathens, right? We're like, how does, how does that work? Now, that's not my job to worry about that. But on the other side of coin is we shouldn't be expecting God to rain promises down on us while we're walking and just knowing, knowing that we're walking around in disobedience. They're counterproductive. Nehemiah, um, as we're seeing, is he, he's, knew, he's knowing that the first step toward any restoration and peace with God was an admittance to sin and a confession of those sins, and he was again doing it for himself, for his people, um, and, and, and even for his father. Verse seven, <clears throat> we have acted, verse seven, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. So now we see Nehemiah kind of getting into some of the specifics of what the disobediences were. Um, when he says, we acted corruptly against you, they had not kept the commandment statutes that ordinance passed along from God through Moses. What are those? Well, we're not gonna go through because there's multiple places where you know, Moses got the 10 commandments, Moses gave it to the people, then Joshua gave the same instructions to the people. So as a Jew, <coughs> he would have had the laws of Moses passed down to him just at nauseum. So he would have known. So when he's saying, you know, we acted very corruptly against you, he knows exactly what it is he's referring to. I'm wondering if maybe if you saw Charlton Heston here and the Ten Commandments and that's, you know, what he knows. So I don't know. So he would recall the story of Joshua right when they crossed the Jordan, because at that point too, right, what did, what did Joshua do? He reminded them, it's on the two mountains, you know, blessing, curses, if you do these things, you get these blessings, if you don't, we'll have these. One of the things is you're gonna be scattered abroad. Guess what happens? They're scattered abroad now. So he knew the law and the consequences depending on what they, <clears throat> what he did with them and what the children <clears throat> of Israel did with them. Verse eight. Remember, I pray, <clears throat> the word that, your that you command your servants, Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. So they were getting the consequences of Leviticus 26.33, 
as a promised consequence of retribution against them for not being obedient. Verse 33 says, I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities a waste. Guess what's going on now? Again, scattered, been in Babylon for 80, 90 years. Cities just a mess. There's very few people left there. The people are there. They weren't valued enough to take back to Babylon. Um, so this it's just it's it's a nightmare there. But I think <clears throat> knowing the laws, like I am saying he did, and and the repercussions and what was passed down from the generations from Moses to uh, to the people and to Joshua, then to the people. Um, I think maybe he thought of Leviticus 26, 44, and 45, which says, yet, after, yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor will I abhor them to utterly destroy them or break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of nations, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. So Nehemiah, I think, is remembering, you know, uh, with God the consequences the bad ones, and then I think he's, you know, frankly about to turn to the positive things that God has promised. And again, I think he's remembering, you know, once we're saved, once you're God's people, you're God's people. You can do stuff, run away, you can hide and all that kind of stuff. I think you're hiding anyway. Um, but ultimately, you're not, you know, you're not just going to be discarded, right? We're, we're a value to him. So even in the midst of sin, disobedience, God will not leave us either. Um, we can rely on, that, rely on that as a as a promise of God, just as they were able to rely on, if you follow me, if you return to me, I'll bring you back to your land. We can rely on the promises as well. Verse 9, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So the consequences of a blessing of return to God are found in Deuteronomy 30, two through five. Um, and I think they would have been trying to hold on to these pretty doggone tight. And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart, with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. <clears throat> then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and prosper you and multiply uh, and multiply you more than your fathers. So you may say, "Why? Well, well, I'm too afraid to come back to God. It's it's God scary. He's mad." Um, but he's not mad. He's not ticked. He wants you to come back. Frankly, he's waiting for you to come back. And just like here, right? There's promises for them when they come back. And repenting, they would once again see the blessings that were promised to their ancestors, the land, you know, Israel, they would get it back. They would, um, they would be able to go home. Psalm 85, one through eight is a prayer that the Lord will restore favor. This is kind of in line with this. It says, Lord, you have been favorable to your land you have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin, Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what the... What God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. So as you read this, and then you read the other verses about the promises and the curses, um, yeah, there's some negative in there. Um, and then specific to this verse that I read, 
It's like 95% positive. Really, the only thing that jumps out to me is, is our responsibility, if you will, is don't return to folly. So do you want him to um, you know, um, show favor to you? Do you want him to return you to your land? You know, do you want him to stop being wrathful to you? Um, you know, just, you know, what's your part? <laughs> Don't be stupid, right? Follow. Don't be disobedient. So, and then, right, even the part of the prayer here is we're sinners. We're always going to be sinners by grace, faith. God can take us and bring us closer to being like Jesus where we fall off wagon, hopefully less and less every day. But even that, right, we see here, this is a prayer, and they're even saying, um, but let them not turn back to folly. So our power to not even return back to folly is not here in us, it's in our Father. So, um, but you think, you know, you hear people, I'm trying to this, I'm trying to that, you know, it's, you can try all you want, and yeah, it's important that you do your part, for lack of terms, but the power is not in you, it's in God. Which, guess what? We have God in us, so we have some power too. So who's one that wants to remind us and keep us from forgiveness, right? The enemy. He even reminds us that there are certain things that we just can't be forgiven from or we can't be restored from. Um, you know, here in some places that, you know, if you've been divorced, you can't be a deacon. Well, I don't know where that is, right? I don't know that you can be married to multiple wives and be a deacon at the same time. I don't think that works, right? But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it, 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 um, there's redemption. You know, we, we can be forgiven and then we can start enjoying our relationship with God again. But the devil is our enemy he wants to cheat us from what? A relationship with God. And the only time we have a relationship with God is when there's unresolved sin. So if you're not a Christian, you for sure have unresolved sin. And then if you are a Christian but you're walking in sin, you're probably not going to have a real good relationship. And it's not because he's hiding. I know when I'm not doing good things, I don't necessarily want to have a whole lot of conversations with God. So, you know, the enemy knows if he can keep you down, remind you, um, he's got you beaten because maybe you won't go and repent. And if you don't repent, there's no relationship. He's won. So um, we don't want to let him win. So Nehemiah understood that God's grace after repentance was a solution to reconciliation and restoration. Verse 10. Now these are your servants and your people who you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. I think in verse 10, um, Nehemiah is just, he's just telling um, God who he's praying for. I think God already knows who he's praying for. Um, but he says, you know, your servants, your people, and you're redeemed. Again, God knows who these people are. But I get the sense that Nehemiah is begging here, right? Um, he wants to make sure that God is, is listening. And how do we make sure that he listens? God, these are your people. These are your servants. You do something with them. That's why I'm praying, so you can get involved. Again, I think God already knew. I think, I think Nehemiah is doing this more for his own benefit um, than anything, but, but he's being passionate about those he's praying for. And then he says, um, you know, verse 11, it says, Oh, Lord, I pray, please. Here again, I get the sense that it's, Oh, Lord, please, right? Be attentive to our prayers because we are desiring to fear your name, to fear your name. So he's like, we're going to do what's right. We're trying. That's our desire. So please listen. Please answer. Then again in verse 11, you know, he's, he's talking about being the king's cupbearer. Um, now, as we said in, in, in last week, that 
you know, there's one school of thought that you're a cupbearer, not very important. You're taking sips and, and dips of whatever the king's eaten. So if there's poison, you die. How great is that? Um, but then on the other side of that, your cupbearer's got to be somebody you trust because it's like, yeah, king, this is great. You know, blah, 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 eat something different and give it to the king and he dies. So it's a trusting position. And it was talk that he carries a signet ring. And like I said, if you got the signet ring, you can write stuff, you stamp it. It's, it's, it's gold. Um, so again, another thing of, of um, being trusting. But I think he, he here is just saying, Lord, I'm just a cupbearer. Um, he's like, what can I do, right? And what can I do because I'm just this? I don't have an education, so I can't X. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I'm not, fill in the blank with whatever you want to, right? We always see, well, I shouldn't say we always see, but often we'll see our situation and the gifts that we have is not enough to accomplish something. So he's just a cupbearer. Um, but at the end of the day, right, cupbearer, God put him there. God wants to use him as a cupbearer. Guess what's going to happen? He's going to be used as a cupbearer. As a matter of fact, cupbearer might have been one of the few people that had an opportunity for the king to, because he would see him every day, would see him at down times, if you will, when he's eaten, when it's probably casual, maybe carry on some conversations or whatever. Um, you know, so he had him in a, in a, in a pretty important place. Um, and ultimately, kind of getting to this, if he was just a, quote, cupbearer, um, you and faith plus God is a majority. Matthew 17, 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move for there, from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Um, the Nehemiah, you know, we'll, we'll see, he's able to move the proverbial mountain over time. Because who would have thought that just a cupbearer would get the king to say, yeah, go ahead and take care of stuff. I'll give you people, I'll give you resources, I'll let your people go, I'll give you money, I'll give you protection. Go take care of it. Who's going to do that? It's a pagan king. What, is, what does he care about Israel? What does he care about Jerusalem? What does he care about God? But ultimately, God would make Nehemiah prosper. He would do his work. God would do his work through the king. And we should not forget that God is big, and with him, any problem is what? Small. Nehemiah wanted to be part of the solution. He felt called. He was making it clear he was available. He had a burden for God's people. He had um, a commitment to his purpose, whatever it was. Um, he was... You know, with a king, probably in luxury by comparison to his other brothers and sisters that were there. So him going off to Jerusalem, you know, on some levels is probably going to have to rough it, especially in consideration of, of what his lifestyle probably was. But he was good with that. He was like Paul, right? When Paul talks in um, Philippians 3.8 about counting everything rubbish, he was willing to, to give it all. Paul says in verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, rubbish that I may gain Christ. So I'm not trying to compare what um, Paul and Nehemiah would have to um, handle or take, because um, you follow the life of Paul. He was, uh, he was beaten, stoned. I mean, he just, you know, had a lot of stuff done to him, and you know he still had his eyes on the on the proverbial prize. So, uh, as we continue in the book of Nehemiah, we will see a man sold out, willing to be used for God and God's purposes. He would overcome any obstacles. He would confront enemies, and like we said last week, enemies would be internal and external. And frankly, sometimes the internal enemies are tougher to deal with than the external enemies. I expect that come from the outside, in the walls of this church. For instance, I would not necessarily to be challenged in a negative way by somebody. You would expect in, encouragement and challenge, yes, but challenge in a positive way because there's a difference. Um, not you can't do that because you're not good enough or whatever. Um, so he and the people would persist and they would complete the task of, of building the wall and their hearts would return back to God, which ultimately, um, as we kind of talked last week, that was the 
goal of exercise was to repent, return to God, go home, create um, you know, the society, um, the city, um, inhabit, again, renewed as a city and a people that can be looked at and said, those are God's people, that's why they do things the way that they do it, not look at them, which while they're in Babylon, they're probably being looked at this way. Look at them, they're no different than we are. What do we have to learn from that? They're set apart for a reason, in part, to be looked at differently so they can draw people to Christ. And we similarly, as we walk in the world, we might not get a chance to say anything, but our actions should be speaking very loudly wherever we go, such that people know us to be different.